We are left with just last lecture from Dr. Vimal Shah, who is going to speak on uh, introduction to the pushover analysis for the earthquake resistance uh, designs. Dr. Vimal Shah, please. I suppose it is uh, already late afternoon and so I would like to uh, say greet all of you with a uh, uh, good evening. And uh, I would not, uh, it, it seems that I am left with uh, some less time than what was expected. Anyway, I will try to do whatever uh, I can. Our, uh, right from the morning today, we have been talking about earthquakes. And I suppose that whatever are the <coughs> terminologies which have been used here, uh, it seems that it is quite a heavy topic, but uh, the speakers which we had, the range of speakers which we had, were really very varied. And that is why I could see so many people uh, staying back at the back end of this particular workshop. Uh, so we are going to talk about something which is related to this uh, one particular slide I wanted to show was that uh, however well we may have designed our structures, when it comes to earthquake resistance, a lot depends on the people who are actually executing it and they are the bar vendors. Uh, structural engineers can give all the details, they can have very beautiful drawings and they can uh, rest assured that they have done their best as far as the coded provisions are concerned and as far as whatever is to be done. But when it comes to execution, it is the bar vendors and that is why there was a, a bar vendors uh, a training which I had uh, proposed and uh, I have done. And just this is for the information of all of you who are here, that if at all uh, you require some material which is there in Gujarati on explaining the bar vendors what can be done to reduce this earthquake risk. So there are, there are some uh, uh, few laminated things which are uh, explaining the bar vendors what they can do on their part. So uh, I would be able to dispute that. Uh, today's talk, which I am going to talk, uh, uh, give, deliver, is regarding introduction to pushover analysis, one of the modern methods of detecting and uh, particularly of uh, retrofitting after the, uh, the lecture which we heard about retrofitting. Uh, I would like to say there are some modern techniques also available uh, by which Either you want to retrofit a building or you want a new building to perform in a particular way in which you want it to behave. So that is uh, as far as the aspect resistance is concerned. So that is why I am going to talk about pushover analysis which is a modern technique using computers. The basics about performance of a building under earthquakes and factors affecting capacity and demand. We are going to meet the capacity and the demand and that is what we call as the performance point. And we are going to also talk about what are the steps which are to be followed in pushover analysis and use of pushover analysis with example. One example also I have taken how you can use this pushover analysis to uh, useful uh, work which we want to do. So buildings are designed as uh, all of us know, they are designed as far your building codes which are known as uh, prescriptive design. So we are, we are given some prescription and we design it accordingly but the, it, is a, it is a methodology which is based on meeting all requirements of the code and the code does not specify what will be the limits uh, suffered by a building in the event of an earthquake, particularly so when you have got buildings which are having all sorts of geometries, you know, you do not have regular geometries and particularly each and every building will perform in a different manner given the same amount of force which is exerted on it. See what happens is that our codes only specify how much amount of uh, forces you have to apply on them and when you apply that different buildings would uh, behave in a different manner. So actually speaking our codes do not specify what will be the state of the building although we have seen that uh, damage is allowed but collapse is to be prevented that is what is the purpose of our codes. Okay, so we definitely know that it will not be collapsing but what will be the state of damage which is uh, very difficult to predict and uh, people have always uh, strived to uh, just specify what will be the final state of your building. Thus if, you, if uh, one wants to know what will be the performance of the structure under earthquake forces, we have an answer in the form of pushover analysis. Uh, 
Portal, uh, portal provisions are based on linear elastic behavior. We feel that uh, your structure should not go beyond, uh, so all our theories are basically elastic theories. And that is what we are doing. So we give, uh, uh, we uh, basically uh, just uh, think about our codes, specify certain loadings, we give a factor of safety to those loadings, and then design the buildings to resist that in the elastic range. But as you know, uh, in case of an earthquake, we are not taking the full force which is likely to occur in the time of an earthquake. It is very difficult to predict that. And that is why, in case of an earthquake, uh, buildings are likely to go beyond the last three limit. That is, it will be entering the non-linear behavioral sea of the structural elements which are quite expected. So, when it goes to the non-linear stage, we have to have certain uh, insight into that. And safety is defined as the structure's ability to deform in the ela inelastic range, but no collapse is allowed. That is what uh, uh, Professor C. S. Sanghvi also has uh, very well uh, explained to us. Performance objectives, as it is uh, very well uh, demonstrated by uh, Professor Sanghvi also, under minor taking, we should not have any damages. This is what uh, a building is expected to perform. Under a moderate earthquake, you can say that there can be a few damages here and there, but it should be in an immediate occupancy state. And finally, in case of a very strong motion, a strong earthquake which is happening, then the collapse should not be there, saving the lives. Okay, so properties can be damaged, but lives are the <coughs> topmost priority which is there in our case. So performance objectives, if we define in terms of your magnitude, we can say that major earthquake, uh, minor earthquakes we mean by magnitude 4 and 4.9, it is somewhere between that, uh, on the Richter scale. Uh, moderate is defined as uh, magnitude 5 to 5.9, so no structural damages are supposed to be occurring there. And in case of a major earthquake of this particular magnitude between 6 and 6.9, with structural damages, but ensures life safety. And finally, in case of a severe earthquake, which is more than magnitude 7, uh, the collapse should be prevented. This, these are what are expected, our buildings are expected to perform. Now analysis methods, if I talk about, then you have got uh, two types of analysis methods. The one is elastic, which is based on the linear thing, and inelastic, which we call as your non-linear ring. So the elastic will indicate where the first yield will occur. We do not go beyond the yield point, so that is what is in the elastic theory, and it cannot predict the failure mechanism. So how the failure is going to occur or where the failure is going to occur, we do not know. So as, as against the ITC go by, your inelastic nonlinear, it helps to demonstrate how the structure will behave when subjected to major earthquakes. So when subjected to major, major earthquakes, what I mean is that it is going to go into the inelastic stage. So at that time, it is very important to understand how it will be behaving. And in the inelastic dynamic response of the structure, see we are not talking about dynamic, uh, if we try to give, if we want the exact analysis, we have to give the dynamic forces. But what I am going to talk about is, or what we have is that the best way is to go for your nonlinear time test analysis. But the shortfalls of uh, time test analysis is one, that it is very, very uh, cumbersome in the sense that it is very time consuming. And further, you have to give all the time histories of all the earthquakes which have occurred, which, uh, and further, what happens is that even after applying all the earthquake time histories which have occurred so far, if you subject your structure to that, you are not sure that the same type of an earthquake motion is going to be repeated. And it cannot be repeated. So it is very difficult to predict, uh, uh, but it is a very time consuming thing. And further, usually for normal structures, it is not warranted for. So we have found another way which we call as the pushover analysis. It is an approximate method. You understand we are not saying that this is exactly how it will be. It is an approximate method. But it simplifies the non-linear time history analysis process to quite an extent in the sense that you have to apply only, it is also known as your uh, uh, non-linear static procedure. So it is a static load which we are applying. We are not applying any dynamic load as what are expected in case of an earthquake. But by applying the static loads and going into the nonlinear state, we are going to uh, uh, see what uh, the structures are going to happen. So in the push analysis, what we do is that uh, uh, the structure is subjected to monotonically increasing lateral forces. 
So what happens is that when you apply the forces at various levels, there will be a base shear which is developed at the base in the form of a reaction and this base displacement, uh, sorry, the base shear versus the root displacement, root of level is going to displace to the maximum and mind you that we are applying only static loads and also that too also in only one direction which is not the exact uh, representation of your earthquake forces but what we are going to do is that when you are going to push the structure as the name itself suggests we are going to push the structure in one direction only and see what will be the failure mechanisms which are developing. It is something like we are going to put number of observation points on the structure, on the beams as well as on the columns. It, it is as if we have uh, backed up our structure with number of observation points like we have got number of strain gauges which are applied to the structure and the only thing is that we are not uh, analyzing the actual structure, we are analyzing a model. So, we are going to have some number of things and <coughs> this, uh, when we keep on increasing this, so it is uh, the pushover curve is what is defined as that it is the equivalent single degree of freedom system. See, we have got multi degree of freedom systems actually when you have got a multi fluid building. So, there are uh, various uh, degrees of freedom, but we are going to convert it into a, an equivalent single degree of freedom system which is representing. Uh, representative of the dynamic response of the structure in its first mode which is usually the dominant mode uh, and we are going to uh, it is achieved by analyzing the structure under a set of slowly increasing representative lateral loads so lateral loads are being applied and the resulting ratio versus root displacement plot is used to compute its response to any given set of ground motions now what is the response is what we call as, this is what we call as the capacity of the building to resist your lateral force. So, the pushover curve, it is also known as the capacity curve, is the property of a building and it varies from building to building. How strong is a building will or, or how flexible is a building if you want to call it. Now, because we are going to talk about the flexibility or rather we will say that how ductile, the main uh, uh, terminology is the ductility of the building. So, how much can it deform before it collapses is dependent on this capacity curve. So, every building will have certain capacity and that capacity as you know if we talk about only linear elastic thing, we are going to talk about only up to this point. Okay, so beyond this what is happening is that we are going into the inelastic or what we call as your non-linear stage. So, what will happen is that this particular curve which we call as the capacity curve is sometimes uh, idealized into a bilinear behavior. So, we do not have a smooth curve something like this, but instead we convert that particular capacity curve into two parts. One is the <coughs> uh, linear part which we can extend the linear part up to this point and then we have another linear part which is usually about 10 percent of that. So, the slope is about 10 percent upwards in this uh, non-linear part. So, that is it is also known as your bilinear idealization. One is your uh, elastic and another is your uh, inelastic behavior. As against this, we have got something what we call as the demand, which is, what is the demand? The code, the codal provision puts a demand onto the structure that the structure has to uh, uh, resist so much amount of force and that is what we call as your demand curve. So, if you say that your, your design structure is defined by our curve, and it will be something like an acceleration versus time period. This is the graph which is available in our IS1893. And accordingly, you have got three uh, things. And in case of your IS1893, you will have your demand. This is what is known as your demand curve. And this is for your 5 percent damping. Now, usually, in case of your concrete structures, your initial damping, damping is a force which is trying to bring back the structure to its original position after some displacement is given to the structure. So, if you have initially a 5 percent damping, now in the case of an earthquake, when you shake a building for a few cycles this way and that way, what will happen is that because your uh, structure is going to go beyond the elastic limit, there are certain plastic hinges which are likely to occur. Okay, and these plastic hinges, as they go on increasing, the capacity of the structure to resist the or to absorb the energy which is produced by the earthquake will go on increasing 
and that means it will increase the damping. And that is why your demand which started with 5% damping will start going on reducing and your damping will go on increasing up to say 20% or even more than that. So 5, 15, it depends on uh, when you achieve that. So what will happen is that as your, uh, the initial curve which was here will get reduced to, this is what we call as your reduced demand and that is why when your reduced demand is there, so this is the time period versus acceleration and your capacity curve was in the form of your force versus deformation. So this particular graph which you call as the demand curve has to be converted into what you call as your ADRS format that is acceleration displacement response factor. So acceleration response, uh, this response factor will maintain its shape something like this but this has been converted into a graph of acceleration that is what we call as your SA uh, that is your <coughs> spectral acceleration versus your spectral displacement which we call as your SD and whatever was your time period which was represented by the horizontal axis now that time period becomes the